Does everybody have their chapter five stuff? Chapter five slides? No? Nope. All right. So actually, this is a review slide, and I'll show you kind of where we are. We already talked about this, and I'm not going to start back there. But I've got some pictures to show you of the 10 cloud types. And um, I'm just going to look out the window, see if Well, let's look at this, and then, then we'll all look out the window. Gaze out the window, see what we think is out there. So clouds are classified by low, middle, or high. If they're low, they don't have any prefix. If they're middle, they have an alto prefix. If they're high, somewhere in their name, they have like Ciro or Cirrus. Okay? And you'd be like, I don't know what they are. Well, just do your best. Sometimes there's more than one cloud type up there. We have two precipitating clouds, and they have NIM or NIMB associated with them. And then we have flat and fluffy clouds. If it's flat, it's stratus. If it's fluffy, it's cumulus of so sorts. So here they are all at once, all 10 of them. Okay. And I like this figure because it's kind of broken down into low, medium, and high. Okay. So again, the highs have kind of zero or cirrus associated with them. The middles have alto associated with them. And the lows have nothing. We have a low flat, and we have a low flat fluffy. Okay. And we have two precipitating clouds, nimbostratus and cumulonimbus. And that's kind of the deal of it. So well, let's all go back here. Right there. Road trip. <laughs> okay, not very much of a road trip. <laughs> Do you guys remember I said if you hold out your hand, and because to me that looks like a fluffy cloud, kind of. Maybe not. It looks kind of wispy too. But the whole holding out your hand, if it is a sort of cumulus cloud, and if it's as big as your fist, it's a low cloud. And if it's as big as your thumb, it's a alto sort of cloud. As big as your pinky, it's a zero sort of cloud. So what do you think? Is that a low, middle, or high? I'm curious what you guys think. We've got three windows here. What do you think? I think it really could look like a middle. I agree. So do you think it's flat or fluffy? Flattish. Flattish. So you've just narrowed it down to one of the 10 cloud types. Mm -hmm. So it would be? Would that be the, uh, the uh, alto stratus? Yep, alto stratus. Yep. Oh, here's, how about this over, you guys can see it there. How about this kind of over here? I agree with that. What about kind of around the moon and kind of below the moon? What elevation do you think that is? I would say they're higher too, yeah. You think they're a... Yeah, because do they, they look kind of flat to me. Do they look kind of flat to you? Okay, so they're high, flat. So actually, you have two choices, and to me, they're kind of hard to distinguish. Yeah, they look more like cirrus yeah. So you have regular cirrus are usually even the highest, highest. Cirrostratus, you think maybe? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. The thing of the the way you can sometimes kind of differentiate between these two is the cirrus. Sometimes they're called mares tails. They're they're the highest, and they get the the winds blowing the fastest up there, so they actually kind of get some whispers. Okay, that's the end of our field trip. <laughs> so 10 cloud types. So if you're doing your photo projects, um, remember that each, you have to have nine different things, but each different cloud is a thing. So I've had students kind of come in and they say, well, what kind of cloud do you think it is? I'm like, I don't know, what kind of cloud do you think it is? <laughs> so... It's, it's hard to tell in a picture. It's even hard to tell when you're there. So 10 cloud types. So now this is a new slide. We didn't get to this slide. So this is just the slide after that. And basically, I like it. It's a table from your textbook. And it has the 10 cloud types. Remember, the cloud types have uh, nice little abbreviations that go along with, and they kind of make sense. Or pick on alto stratus is capital A, lowercase s. Now, for your test, you don't have to memorize the 
two symbol that go along with the name, okay? But you do have to have a sense of kind of the description of the cloud, okay? And just like we did before, these are broken out by low, okay? Um, let's see, these are low, middle, and high. Okay. All right. So now I just have some pictures. When I was getting ready for tonight's lecture, I thought, oh, how nice. And the picture stuff are kind of like, I don't know, easier. And at the end of the evening, just there will be a few things for you guys to think about with regard to meteorology. Okay, So stratus, the fact that it doesn't have alto in front of it or not zero means that it's lower level. So as soon as I have a stratus cloud, you know it's flat and you know it's pretty low. Okay, And a good example of a flat low cloud would be fog, okay? So our strat so fog would be best like a stratus cloud. But it doesn't have to be. You can have a low flat cloud that isn't fog. Um, stratocumulus is one of my least favorite types of clouds. I think I might have complained about that before because it's like an oxymoronic sort of cloud and it has both kind of flat and a little bit of fluff to it, okay? Um, Notice anything that's flat actually forms in what we call stable air. Remember we talked about stable air doesn't want to rise and unstable air does want to rise. Okay, so it's flat, it's stable air, um, and if it's a, a cumulus sort of cloud, it's unstable. Okay, and I've got pictures to go along with each one of these. So cumulus, um, now cumulus I usually think of as a relatively low cloud that's fluffy, okay, um, but it's got some vertical development, so it's fluffy, so actually that fluff is because of it, the air is wanting to rise. We have a couple variations on cumulus clouds. We have fair weather cumulus clouds, and then we have cumulus congestus, or towering cumuluses. Now, the big granddaddy of them all, of course, is cumulonimbus, and cumulonimbus means that you have a crazy sort of um, fluffy cloud that's precipitating. Um, okay, so some pictures. I'll kind of dim the lights here. So that would be what stratus cloud looks like fog. Actually, um, we're going to talk about different types of uh, fog here tonight. Um, uh, this is the stratocumulus. You can kind of see the layered, but a little bit of fluff. Again, that one's hard for me to tell. And then this one is just kind of relatively low-level fluffy clouds. So this would be just simply cumulus. And the little asterisk says they're low-level with the potential of rising up in the troposphere, being a column, okay? So, all right, so we have two raining clouds, two precipitating clouds. We have a flat precipitating cloud, nimbostratus, and relatively low, not very uh, deep. And then we have, like I said, the granddaddy of them, the storm cloud. So hopefully, um, and we'll be, when we talk about uh, severe weather here in the Midwest, severe weather like uh, thunderstorms, tornadoes, hail, um, that all comes from cumulonimbus cloud. Nimbostratus cumulonimbus. So there's a photo of a nimbostratus cloud. You know, I don't see it precipitating, but I'll just have to take their word for it. Um, one of the things I tell students is that if you see it all dark like that, you know, that kind of usually gives you the creeps, and it, me anyway. Um, it usually means that it's very dense. Um, it's very dense or it has a lot of vertical development. Basically, the reason it's dark is because light trying to get through the cloud is all scattered because you have <laughs> a lot of raindrops. Okay, and then this is a cool looking storm cloud. And we'll be talking when we we'll be talking about severe weather. Um, in last week we talked about the lifting condensation level, and I don't know if you can kind of see it, but it looks nice and flat. Okay, that's an F there, flat. Um, that is the LCL. Um, they tell you in um, when you're when you're dealing with severe weather like that. Do you see where this is nice and crispy, nice and and the guy in the training that I've gone to the National Weather Service, he calls it like cauliflower. It looks like crispy cauliflower. Okay, that means it's just relatively new. 
In fact, today it wasn't a storm cloud, but if you see clouds that have kind of a fuzzy edges, that's a good chance that cloud is kind of breaking up or it's been there a while. But something that's nice and crispy, it just punched through the at it or is punching through the atmosphere. Okay, so those are our raining clouds, uh, nimbostratus and cumulonimbus. And then we have two middle layer clouds. So if it's middle, it has to have the word alto. So we have a middle flat and we have a middle fluffy. And so you kind of see um, a theme here. Anytime you have a flat cloud, okay, relatively stable air. Anytime you have a fluffy cloud, it's probably unstable air. And this is where I said um, with the middle cloud, it should be about the size of your thumb, okay, the fluffs. So here's some pictures of those. So you can kind of see the little fluff balls here, the little ridges. So that means it's cumulus, and you're kind of gauging the elevation in its middle, so alto cumulus. Okay, oops, where's my other one? Okay, and this is alto um, stratus. So a lot of times these stratus sort of clouds that are middle level, alto stratus, and uh, high uh, stratus clouds, the cirro stratus, you can still, they're thin, so you can actually, like this, you can still see the sun, or you can still see the moon. And the other thing, actually, chapter 16 next week we'll talk about, the presence of that cloud gives some kind of some cool effects, um, something called a corona or a halo around the sun or the moon. So sometimes they call that watery. Does the sun look watery to you? So it's on a disk, yeah. And that means that there's a cloud there, but you can still see it, so. All right, so then the high clouds are cirro cirrus or something. So we have a high fluffy cloud, cirro cumulus. And then we have a high flat cloud, cirro stratus. And then we have the high of highest, cirrus. So yeah, I think when we looked out the window just a little bit ago, that didn't look like the high, high cloud to me, but it looked flat, so I like zero stratus for that. And then these, um, you kind of gauge that they're very high because they'll be about the size of your pinky. Pinky. And that uh, video we saw called it these guys, and you're going to see a picture here in a minute, but these are what's called sometimes a mackerel sky. Like the fish, I can't spell, but something like that. That's the fish. So it kind of looks like fish scales because it's about the size of your pinky. When we talk about cool kind of what we call optical effects, um, I mentioned just a minute ago, um, halos is one of the effects that can come from those flat um, high clouds or middle clouds, cirrostratus or altostratus. Okay. So here are some pictures. So I don't know if that looks like a mackerel sky, but that's what I mean by kind of a mackerel sky. The little fluffs there would be about the size of your pinky. Okay, so that's um, cirro cumulus. And you can definitely see this actually is called a, uh, let's see, this is a halo. It's like a little angel halo. There's another thing that's round like that called a corona. And that actually will touch the sun or the moon. A halo has a space between the sun or the moon. Um, so that, there's a wispy cloud there, and that is the cirrostratus. And then this is your mare's tail, okay? So this is a mare's tail. And this would be your highest, so this is a cirrus. And does it look like a mare's tail to you? Okay, and then there is this cloud. <laughs> um, this actually is a jet condensation trail, okay? So it's a jet condensation trail, and it's called a con trail, condensation trail. The condensation part comes from this little jet up here is like our uh, burning fossil fuels, like we burn fossil fuels in your car. 
And when you burn fossil fuels, one of the things you put out is H2O, H2O liquid or gas even. Okay, so that's just what he's pumping out. So one of the things about condensation trails, what I think is interesting, is they give you a sense for what the humidity's like up there. So check this out. Does this make sense to you? If this was dry, if the air was dry up there, okay, does it make sense that if the air's pretty dry, even though that jet's putting out water vapor, then it'd be harder for it to leave a condensation trail. Okay, if the air's pretty dry, you're less likely to get that condensation trail. The other thing is, haven't you seen sometimes condensation trails last a long time, and then sometimes they're just like... So then I go, I go back to your dry air. If your air's pretty dry, your trail might be formed, but then it doesn't necessarily linger. Sometimes I see them last forever, okay? So um, I'm gonna have to tell on my son just a little bit. So he's one of these um, conspiracy theory sort of people. How old is Craig? He's, is he 25? But anyway, so there is, and you have to look it up, and some of you, you may have heard this before. So we call this a contrail. There's something called a chem trail. Oops. C-H-E-M trail. Now, I'm not saying I buy into this. The difference between a contrail and a chemtrail. Chemtrail would be that, um, if you've ever seen the movie um, They Live, with the, yeah. A chemtrail would be that there's somebody up there that's actually kind of like a crop duster sweeping chemicals on people to make them subservient or something. So I'm not saying I believe it, but I'm just saying it's out there. But all seriousness aside, when we talked about the effect of clouds, because you guys told me clouds can have a blocking effect you know, or have a warming effect at night and a, and a cooling effect during the day. When we talk about the effect of clouds, well, if, if we are doing our jet activity and creating a man-made cloud, you know, our, what effect is that having on, on the climate? I'm just kind of throwing it out there. I think your textbook kind of talks about it a little bit. After 9-11... Um, right after 9-11, probably for, I don't know, I don't know if it's 24 hours, maybe only 12 hours, but basically all jet activity <laughs> was stopped across, um, you know, North America. And um, I know that the scientists, I can't remember the details, but it, it was a, a good opportunity for us to kind of do some, some quick scientific work there, see what the effect of no jets going across had. Um, okay, so chemtrails. All right, so back to reality, con, con trails and chemtrails. Um, there are some other kind of miscellaneous cloud types. So now these aren't the 10 main types, but these are kind of miscellaneous. I have a picture of this coming up. We have cirrus uncinus, I don't know. Um, but it looks like a fancy cirrus cloud, okay? Um, we have fractus cloud. Fractus cloud just kind of means broken, so any of these could be kind of fractus clouds. Um, and then we have a lenticular cloud. Um, if an extra lenticular cloud, if you want to put UFO, you can, because actually this particular cloud is really known for like persisting, and it's been called in and mistaken for basically a big old hovering craft. But it's not. In fact, on Facebook the other day, there was a really pretty picture of a lenticular cloud. And one of my uh, Facebook friends said, now, is this from uh, maybe from HARP or, you know, global warming? I'm like, no, it's just a lenticular cloud. So this is the fancy uh, kind of cirrus clouds with the hooks. Okay. Kind of looks like mirror tails. Now, the caption said something about if you see these, this actually could be a precursor to bad weather coming. And we'll talk more about when weather fronts come in. You actually can get a series of clouds getting lower and lower. Okay. Um, and this is a, a sort of fractus cloud, at least this over here. We're calling it cumulus fractus. The lenticular clouds are here. So does that not look like a hovering craft? Lenticular cloud, UFO. Okay. But um, there, it's only formed by basically um, air going up and over. And even though, I think this is neat, this happens a lot in science, even though it looks like it's hovering, basically what's happening is there actually is wind 
flowing. And so um, this, how do I say this? This is liquid, right? Anytime you see uh, milky white like that, that's liquid. The liquid's going downstream and more gas is condensing. So it's kind of a what we call a dynamic process. Um, these aren't so new, but I'll see what you think. See if you recognize where this picture was taken. There actually would be an eleventh cloud type, I guess, and it reminds me of the 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 word asparagus. Okay, oops, go back. And I bet you've seen these before too. Have you seen these before? Kind of they they don't have flat bottoms. You know, we talked about the 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 elevation that cloud that condensation begins. So so a lot of times clouds first arrive, they all have flat bottoms. The fact that this does not have a flat bottom might kind of think that there's some sort of going on, and there is some sort of kind of up and down movement. So let's see, undulatus aspiratus. I guess the one that I used to show um, came, that was showed over Cedar Rapids, so that's kind of weird. All right. Come back. What else we got? Uh, banner clouds. Banner clouds, I have a picture coming up, and it kind of looks like basically on the, um, the downwind side of a mountain, it looks like you have a, a cloud. It almost looks like a smokestack coming off. Um, and mamatus clouds, mamatus, there's no end. Mamatus clouds, you've probably seen these before. A lot of times they're associated with kind of the underside of what we call the anvil portion of a thunderstorm cell. Okay. A lot of times if you guys have been out when it's storming, you can see it build, it being the cumulonimbus cloud, and it kind of flattens out. And the reason it flattens out is because it basically bumps up against the tropopause Okay, and then underneath that, we call that the anvil, you can see these kind of pouching looking things. Um, and then we have a couple of other miscellaneous clouds. Now, remember when we talked about where the weather occurs, we said the weather occurs in the troposphere. Makes sense. But there are a couple of miscellaneous clouds that go beyond the troposphere, and here they are. We have nacreous clouds in the stratosphere, and believe it or not, we have noctilucent clouds in the mesosphere. Is that not crazy or what? Relatively dry in the stratosphere and the mesosphere, um, but they're there. They're beautiful. Okay, so the mamatus clouds are being shown right here. It was back in 06. I sound like an old farmer, but um, it was in the summer of 06. I can't remember in June or July, but there was like a... Um, a series of clouds that was in Burlington and Keokuk, and they just, they didn't bring any precipitation, so it was no cumulonimbus clouds, but they were just these pouchy looking, they looked like cotton balls like that, the mathis clouds. Uh, nacreous clouds in the stratosphere, and noctilucent clouds in the mesosphere. Does that not look electrifying or what? Um, I'm thinking the noctilucent clouds, of course, Though your best bet is to see them, I don't know if sunrise would work too, but at sunset and in very cold um, regions like near the poles. Okay. So fog. So if I were to, on a test ask you which of the ten cloud types would you most likely say that fog is, hopefully you would say stratus. But anytime you see a cloud, you see a cloud, that milky white is because basically liquid, there's liquid. The vapor has condensed and now it's liquid. In order for condensation to begin, you need to go ahead and have the air saturated, 100% relative humidity. So we've been talking about that. Okay. So how do you, and actually this was your uh, uh, quiz question last week, how do you get 100% relative humidity well, you can do one of two things, and we're going to see that fo we got fog types that do both. One is to cool that air down to reach the dew point temperature, and the other is to basically take that chunk of air and infuse it with more water vapor to reach relative humidity or 100% saturation. 
um, or 100% or saturation. So we're going to talk through four different uh, fog types, four different ways that fog form. Um, and I'll tell you right here, as far as I can tell, in, in southeast Iowa, or this neck of the woods, we have radiation fog and we have evaporation fog. That's our most likely types of fog to have here. But in each one of these cases, these fogs form because the air becomes saturated. So radiation fog is um, like morning fog. Radiation fog is morning fog. And the radiation part that they're talking about is basically that the Earth has, over the course of the night, radiated all its heat away. So it radiated all its heat away. So basically, now it's not radiating anything. So now we have a cold situation. And it's that cooling down that creates the conditions to reach the dew point temperature for radiation fog. This is the type of fog that, um, that kid, little kids hope for in the morning, radiation fog. Sometimes big kids hope for in the morning. Or big kids hope their kids don't have a delay, so they have to figure out what to do with their kids, okay? Um, so, um, like this says, if you're thinking now, am I going to have an issue with fog or not? Well, if before you go to bed at night, if you look at the current temperature and there's only 9 degrees that it needs to lower in order to reach the dew point temperature, you might have a situation there, okay? But the other thing is if you have any wind, you won't get radiation fog. All right, so that's radiation fog. Advection fog. Now, this one I don't really see us having really here in our neck of the woods. Advection fog is the spooky fog that you see on those creepy movies where you just know, you know, the horror movies where you're like, run, run, okay? That's advection fog. We didn't focus on what advection is, but let me kind of tell you what advection is. So convection is this, convection. Like, basically, it kind of moves up and down. and up. Like, we saw convection in a warm pan of water. So it goes up, it cools down, it falls back down, okay? So advection is horizontal, okay? So if, if air is advecting, it's going like that. So advection fog counts on that sort of motion. Um, specifically, or the example they give is if you have warm, toasty ocean water that's advecting over a shallower part, like a bay, that is going to uh, change its temperature more quickly than the ocean. So it can have, be cool there and warm here. So it's that cooler temperature with that warm, moist air. Okay, so that's creepy fog. We don't have much of that. We ha don't have this one either. Do you guys remember we talked about lifting mechanisms, and one of the lifting mechanisms was orographic lifting? Upslope fog and orographic lifting, I go hand in hand. Upslope fog and orographic lifting. Basically, you have air going up, um, up a mountain or a slope, but it's what we talked about before. Kind of the themes in, that's important to understand in meteorology is if something goes up, it gets bigger and it cools down. We call that adiabatic cooling. Okay, so that's how upslope fog forms. Very similar orographic kind of lifting. But isn't this kind of cool how it just kind of. Yeah. We didn't see a banner cloud, did we? Hmm. Okay. The third type of fog, which I think we definitely have here, is got actually got three darn names to it. I hate it when one phenomenon has multiple names. Okay, so this sort of fog could be called evaporation fog. Now, an example of evaporation fog is in your bathroom. Okay, so basically, what's happening with uh, your bathroom to make this sort of fog is this liquid right here. Okay, is basically we have a lot, your shower, depending upon what your setting is, it has a lot, it's very fine, it's got a lot of surface area for those liquid water droplets to go into its gaseous state. So basically we have a lot of liquid going into gas, a lot of liquid water going into water vapor. And so what happens then is your, your shower, your room, your bathroom actually gets saturated. 100% RH. Why? Because you evaporated water vapor into it. That's why it's called evaporation fog. Well, that's not something that you're going to run into in your car. But these are actually all related. These are all the same type of fog. 
Steam fog, I'm going to try to convince you, and actually you've probably seen steam fog before. I know, can't, can't remember what time of year, maybe it's the, I don't know, the spring, fall, maybe even summer. But if this is a river or a uh, lake, Lake Geode, okay, actually you can see sometimes um, this sort of fog form over uh, water like that. And so what's happening is your your lake or your river is nice and warm and toasty. It's stubborn to cool down, okay? And so it basically has an ongoing process of making liquid water go into its vapor phase. So again, you have reached 100% RH, kind of hovering over that body. So it's kind of similar to your bathroom. It's called steam fog. And then the other one, it's the same deal called frontal fog. Um, most I can think of, um, see, a lot of times when people take this class, you're correct if you think, if you have a weather front, a weather front coming through, good chance it's bringing you some precipitation, not necessarily. You can have a cold front come through, no precip. You can have a warm front come through, no precip. In fact, oh my gosh, we'll have to look at it at break, but we're supposed to have some really warm temperatures, aren't we? And a lot of times, I wanted to uh, point this out, if you have a drastic temperature change, like we're having within this maybe 6, 12 hours, um, a lot of times that will bring you some crazy wind, you know, whether it's going, in our case, from cold to warm or whether it's going from warm to cold. You're going to a lot of times have wind. So anyway, frontal fog or fronts a lot of times have precipitation. So the way a frontal fog works basically is um, if you think of these roads, as it used to be sunny and then we got a shower basically these roads are hot okay these roads are hot and so now what happens now they're not only just hot but they're hot and wet <laughs> so hot and wet basically that gives a great opportunity for that liquid to go ahead and go in its gaseous state and then you can saturate this make this a hundred percent rh that's kind of how that works frontal fog frontal fog so in all three of these cases, basically what you're doing is injecting the air with more water vapor. That's what they have in common. They'll, okay, was there one more? I guess that was it. So we have radiation fog and frontal fog. I don't think we have upslope fog or advection fog. But um, here we go. How many days do you have heavy frog? Heavy frog. Heavy fog. Okay. So um, the more closer it is to kind of purple and red, the more fog you have. So they have fog, they have fog, and not so much. I feel like this is something we've already talked about, but why not? One more time. The idea of dew and frost, dew point temperature, okay? Maybe we didn't talk about this part. So, um, so dew, dew and clouds, what they do and fog, what they all have in common is you have saturated the air to get dew, you have saturated the air to get fog, you have saturated the air to get a cloud. Okay. So what this says, and, and maybe you've already run into this before, but if you put, for instance, in the south, they have this is my version of a carport. They have a lot of carports. You, you put your little car under, you know, I don't know why. They don't have as many garages, okay? But you put your car under a carport. So what happens is that actually over the course of the night, okay, it might, it's going to cool off, but that carport, the lid for your carport is actually going to kind of hold in some of your heat. So this is actually going to stay warm. There's a chance that that's actually going to stay warmer than the dew point temperature. So actually... The presence of, this says, trees or carports basically kind of inhibit um, the formation of dew or frost. Okay. So, the temperature at which you, you reach saturation, the temperature, and I, I can't remember if you guys have been recording, if you're doing your weather log, you've been recording the current temperature and the dew point temperature, I think. So, um, the temperature at which condensation begins should be always underneath what your current temperature is, and it's uh, called the dew point temperature. If it's colder than freezing, it's a frost point temperature. Okay, cool. Well, let's take a break, and we'll come back.
about the bottom of the hour.